Hi, I'm Austin Wintry, and welcome back to Magic Moments. Thank you to everybody that checked out the first episode of this series about Gustavo Santaolalla's music for The Last of Us and everything that it has taught me about being a composer. As I mentioned in the previous episode, the goal of this series is to highlight these moments from films and games and things like that that have really inspired me and helped me grow as a composer. The scenes or fragments of music that even in this tiny little sliver of a moment have managed to teach me about the art form as a whole. The scene we're going to look at today is one that I had planned to from the beginning, but before we could get to it, the composer actually passed away, leaving behind one of the most incredible legacies in probably all of music, never mind modern or otherwise. So I felt the need to expand this episode to become a full-fledged tribute. So with that, here is an incredibly indebted fond farewell to the maestro Ennio Morricone. Doing a tribute to Ennio Morricone is actually a really intimidating prospect because the body of work that this man left behind is essentially unrivaled in the whole history of composers. We're talking about hundreds and hundreds of scores for film, TV, he wrote concert music, he made crazy avant-garde albums, he did innumerable arrangements and charts for pop songs. The list is truly unending. The world at large clearly came to know his name because of the filmmaker Sergio Leone and the so-called spaghetti westerns, the Italian westerns uh, most famously starring Clint Eastwood in the 1960s. The score that started it all was the 1964 Leone film, A Fistful of Dollars. It's hard to overstate how revolutionary this approach to scoring the Western was because basically this was the conception of that genre up to that point. So obviously he made this stamp on account of the incredibly different take that he had on these westerns. Never mind the fact that the score is so blatantly anachronistic. It takes a certain kind of diabolical genius, I think, to apply electric guitar and sort of wild sound effects to the world of the 19th century western. And while Fistful of Dollars was the first Leone film, and obviously credit where it's due, the film that truly changed the world was the follow-up the good, the bad, and the ugly. I'm not even going to attempt to try to analyze this score. There have been literal books written about just the music of this film, but I had to start here because I think without these films, we probably wouldn't be talking about Morricone in the same way today, if at all. The amazing thing, though, is that depending on when you came of age and discovered a love of cinema, you probably discovered a completely different score. There is a whole other generation that know him for scores more like this. that a composer with this kind of penchant for the revolutionary and a, a predisposition to be daring and experimental would also have an utterly unmatched gift for lyrical expressive melody. He wrote just suitcases full of gorgeous lyrical themes, one after another after another, including for countless Italian films that were basically never seen by the outside world. For many, the benchmark of most beautiful lyrical movie theme ever written is probably Gabriel's oboe from The Mission, which interestingly, and unlike most of these, actually appears in the film as a source cue, and for which 
decades of concerts and albums and covers followed. I always say one of the greatest achievements a poser could possibly ask for is inspiring someone else to pick up music, no matter what role it plays in their life, whether it's something they pursue professionally or it's just a way that they fill their weekends or it's a way that they have fun with friends or other loved ones or whatever. If they hear a piece of music that says, I want music to become a bigger part of my life now, I feel like that composer has achieved the highest honor. So imagine how it makes me feel when I see something like this. So for his incredible gift of melody, one of the things that is easily overlooked about Morricone was that he was a fearless experimenter. I mean, listen to a score like this. Or who would think to score a bank robbery like this. Obviously the success of the Leone Westerns led to a lot of others. Here's a personal favorite, even though I've never actually seen the original film, but I love this score. 1966, Navajo Joe, starring Burt Reynolds. not typically a fan, with all due respect to Quentin Tarantino, of leaning on licensed music instead of trying to find a way to create something new with a composer. But when you hear a thing like that, and you see just how powerful and evocative it is, it's hard not to just absolutely love it when it crops up a couple of decades later in a context like this. One of the things that's also quite amazing is that it's relatively common for composers to start off as these young firebrand avant-garde experimentalists and get a little bit more conservative with age. Like it would make sense if Morricone started off doing these bold experiments like electric guitars for the old west and, and crazy recorder chanting and bank robberies and all of these kinds of things that he did, and then migrate into a more lyrical, more melodic sensibility. There's plenty of composers that you can see this happening with. But interestingly, he never seemed to give up that spirit of invention, even well into the last couple of decades of his life. How could you imagine any other composer pulling off the start of a film quite like this? I could literally go on forever just sharing cues and scenes that I absolutely adore from this man's body of work. But I want to focus on one that came out when I was in college that really, really taught me this idea that the music can profoundly narrate a scene and not just tell you what's happening, but tell you what's happening through a very subjective lens to give you an insight into the scene that tells you what the director thinks about the scene and what the composer thinks about the scene and maybe what the actors think of the scene, etc., but which is not necessarily quite so literally depicted. This is something that Morricone did throughout his career and that basically every scene I just showed you exemplified this. But this was the one that came into my life when I was starting to look around and take the notion of becoming a composer seriously and it just found me at the exact right moment. This is the 2000 film 
Milena, starring Monica Bellucci and directed by Giuseppe Tornatore, with whom Morricone has shared an incredibly fruitful body of work as well. I don't even have time to go into movies like The Legend of 1900 or Cinema Paradiso and what they brought to film and film music. Save it for another day. Milena is a fascinating, beautiful, and sort of painful film that revolves around this adolescent boy in Italy falling in love with this woman multiple decades older than him and experiencing that kind of first taste of, of young boy love, lust, that shedding of innocence in a way that's simultaneously kind of beautiful and ugly in the pubescent sense. And it's all captured damn well on film, but nothing without Morricone's score. At the beginning of the film, his adult narration is reflecting back that this begins on the day that Italy decided to join Hitler in World War II. So clearly, one of the most seminal moments in all of Italian history. And yet what I love is that he's saying, but there was something more important that marked me that day, which was the first time he saw Milena. So the boy gets a new bicycle and he comes to impress his friends and basically says, can I hang out with you? And they say, sure, but you gotta hang with us our way. And very quickly, they snap to attention like little soldiers because the word comes, here she comes. They all take their seats like pigeons on a wire as we first see Milena walking through. And the score does this incredible job at giving us immediately two different ideas simultaneously. On the one hand, there's this little hint of romance. We feel this beautiful lyrical melody coming out over top what is, on the other hand, a kind of primal and almost carnival-esque sensibility. Both of those things turn out to be very, very important to the journey of this young kid with how he relates to Milena throughout the film. He's instantly captivated by her. And as we realize, the whole town is captivated by her. But what's interesting is that while everyone sneers about her, they have all manner of just absolutely nasty rumors that they spread about her supposed sexual impropriety. The boy, while having an uncomfortable relationship with his own sexuality, sees her almost like an angel. But he's definitely lusting. So it's not trying to portray it overly innocently and overly lustfully. That initial cue really hammers that home, even just in the eloquence of those few seconds. But then moments later, we see him fantasizing about her, sitting outside her home, and we get this dream sequence that brings out just vintage Morricone lyricism. This love theme that is absolutely on par with any other melody he wrote in his whole career. So after giving us this taste that this is all about a boy in love and that it's pure and even though it's sexual in a teenage boy kind of way, he sees her as someone beautiful and magical and perfect. What follows is the scene that I really was eager to share, which is Milena's walk through town. We see a woman walking through town. She's obviously keeping to herself, not trying to cause a fuss, but the camera, and of course the subtitles, are making it very clear that nonetheless, she is causing a fuss. How would you score this? How would you approach this scene? That's the kind of question I ask myself and was certainly asking myself as a kid watching this for the first time. As an experiment, watch how this scene looks with no music.
Well, what I love and what epitomizes the genius of Morricone is that he did not score this in a way that I could have ever expected. Morricone isn't giving us the crowd's point of view. It's not even giving us the kid's earlier perspective of her as this angelic, beautiful, perfect creation. It's giving us his narration of the scene now. He may as well have voiceover, but we don't need it because the music is his voiceover. Ma che c'è l'andare un travaglio che ti ambaga guru? Io non ce l'ho manco per me. Ma cosa mette su un We are seeing a town reduced to a carnival, objectifying her and treating her like a slab of meat, and his heartbreak over that. But rather than fixating on the heartbreak, we're fixating on the over-the-top, absolute craziness of it. It's even cute that the music seems to perfectly line up with her footsteps as we track along hearing the clacking of her heels on the town square. To me, it was one of those moments when I first saw this that I thought, this is what film music or generally media music can be. This is how you help tell a story through score. This is not mere background music and underscore. This is absolutely being a partner with the filmmakers and indeed to complete the film in a way that it would utterly be missing if this music was removed. The chromaticism of the writing gives it this broken, gilded quality where it's not that he's delighting in the carnival, he hates it. And I feel like we're really getting that from the music. How else could you have represented this than through music? Of course, yes, he could have just spoken the words, but would you have felt it anywhere near as much as you do as a result of hearing this score? To me, it's, it's unsurpassed genius, it really is. Seeing this scene as I was coming of age as a composer, it profoundly shook me and made me realize music doesn't just have to amplify the emotions that are there. Music can actually add something fundamentally not there. How amazing that a man in his 70s would look at a film with such a fresh take, with hundreds and hundreds of prior scores, and think, here's something that might be interesting. And here's the last part that's utterly baffling to me. Morricone almost never, maybe never, never, wrote to picture. He would read the script discuss with the director, glean these insights, and then just write the music. Many times they hadn't even shot the film yet. Cues were written based on the idea of the scene and then fashioned to fit afterward. I'm convinced that that is a next level genius that I don't fully understand. Because the truth be told, I've always felt a mixed relationship with that. In my own work as a composer, particularly in film, I love crafting the music almost frame by frame. I love finding ways to make the music really marry the footage, and I feel like I have to be working with the footage to make that happen. Well, Morricone managed to score piles and piles of classic scores where his imagination conjured up the scene, and then somehow it just perfectly came together. That's the part that genuinely challenges my convictions as a composer. I have been sort of dogmatic in my life 
thinking, nope, if you're a film composer, you score the film. If you're a game composer, you work with the developers, you score the game. You don't ever just write music and throw it over the fence. And Morricone essentially made a 70 year career out of doing that and wrote dozens and dozens of classics that will live forever. So it obviously shows what I know, but that's kind of the point of this series. Earlier I said that one of the greatest heights a composer can achieve, in my opinion at least, is inspiring other people to pick up music and to make it a part of their life. But there's another achievement that's just as profound. The writing something that brings people together, even if just for one moment at, say, a concert. That's something that few composers have ever really managed to achieve. And to me, that's the magic. Like I said at the beginning, the so-called spaghetti westerns are the reason why I think any of us know about Morricone today. And the grand apex of that genre is, of course, the good, the bad, and the ugly. And the scene that defined that film was this one. Imagine a piece of music underscoring a guy running around in circles. Decades later would be how one of the greatest bands in all of history would close out their show. And what began as an English horn melody culminates decades later being sung by the freaking audience! doesn't get better than that. Thank you for watching. I'm Austin Wintory, and we'll see you next time.